Children, Children's Church, uh, ages five uh, through second grade, if you'd like to go. Um, it, it, they'll be back there in the back waiting on you this morning. For those of you going to remind in here, go ahead and turn with me to Acts. Acts, we're going to continue our look uh, this morning. So turn to Acts 28. Acts 28, when personal ministry becomes a hard journey. When personal ministry becomes a a hard journey. Now, so far we've been following Paul through this journey on his way to Rome to speak with Caesar. And we see that uh, just like Paul, that we'll face many of the same things that he did. That being shipwrecks of life. We learned that week that we can either sink or swim. Then last week we looked at how do we face the vipers of life? How do we um, face the uh, snakes that just... back on we're trying to use these rechargeable batteries because we're trying to be uh, good stewards with the money uh, that God blesses us with and them little boogers work out good sometimes but sometimes <laughs> they just don't work out as much as you'd like so um, like I said we, we talked about last week facing the vipers in life and we can listen to the critics or we can listen to the creator we can listen to the critics or we can listen to the creator this week I want to talk to you about sickness I want to talk to you about what do we do when we face sickness in life? What are some things we deal with? Because there's a lot of sicknesses in the world today. Not just physical illnesses, but there's mental, social. Folks, there's spiritual sickness. Not too long ago, the leader of North Korea um, took 80 Christians and executed each and every one of them. Not trying to be graphic, but that's the picture. Some as young as 12 and 13 years old. Because he had what he calls pornography, which is Christian literature. You see, in his country, he's the God. He's the king. And anything that takes away from him and his leadership or anything that talks about God other than him is considered an evil thing. Folks, I'm telling you, we live in a spiritually sick world. How could grown men take children out and do such a terrible thing? We live in a sick world. We face sickness every single day. There's people in this room this morning, you're facing sickness in your own personal life. You've got people, there's, there's not a person in this place today that's not facing some type of sickness with a friend, a brother, a sister, a loved one. So I want to talk to you this morning, how do we handle those things? I believe that in our text today that Paul teaches us and gives us some guidelines. Actually, there's only two choices to choose from. So with that being said, if we will read our text this morning, Acts 28, verses 7 through 10, Acts 28 verses 7 through 10. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publis, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father lay sick in fever and dysentery and Paul visited him and prayed and putting his hand on him healed him. And when this had been taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly. And when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. Let us pray. Father, I pray that you would move in our hearts and lives as always. Lord, I have no doubt that the devil has tried to be a distraction here today. Lord, not just with batteries, but with a few other things that have happened before I ever got here. 
But Lord, we're not going to let those things get us down because we know that when the devil's trying to stop it, that just means something great's about to start. So Father, I pray that we come here today not as a scheduled exercise of our life. I pray, Father, that we come here today because we truly desire to sing and praise and Lord, learn from your word. Lord, your word is not complicated. It's very simple. So, Father, I pray that we can learn from it and, God, that we can apply it to our hearts and our lives. Father, lead us and guide us this day. Lord, let me be nothing but a broken vessel. Lord, that's the way I feel most days. And, Lord, if there's any good in me, let it be through the restoration of the Holy Spirit. Father, I know that there's some dealing with sickness in their hearts today. I know that. And Father, I pray that when we come to the time of invitation, I pray that we'd be obedient, whatever you would have us to do. So Father, lead this time. Lead us and guide us, Lord. In Jesus' name, all God's children say, amen. One thing we can't deny is that there's sickness in the world. You know, there, there's just, and, and folks, I'm not talking about a sniffle or two. I'm not talking about um, not feeling your best every morning. I'm, I'm talking about real sickness. So the question I want to ask you is, what do we do when we see the need? What do we do when we see the need of others in sickness? What, what is it that we can do? I believe that Paul gives us two choices here. The first choice is, and that's not the one that Paul went with is we can ignore it we can simply give up and walk away ignore i like it doesn't even exist i was watching a movie on tv not too long ago and and this couple um uh, boat had a wreck and they they went up on an island and they had been there for a while and they they met these other people that were on the island and it was a utopia it was paradise everything was like it should be So much so, there was only one rule on the island. No one was allowed to leave the island. Because if you left the island and told people, they might come. But everybody was so happy with the island, who would want to leave? But the problem is, about halfway toward the movie, someone got hurt. Badly. But you know, it could have been fixed with a few antibiotics. A little trip to Carol. And it had been all right. But they couldn't get to Carol. She's the doctor, by the way. You're busy. So the problem was, here's what happened. The man would moan and groan, and he was miserable. And it kind of brought the party down for everybody, you know? So they all had a meeting and decided to do this one thing. Let's take him and carry him to the other side of the island, make him a little makeshift tent, and leave him there. If he lives, he lives. If he dies, he dies. But we, won't, but we won't have to hear his suffering anymore. So they picked him up and took him over there and just left him there to die. And they went back to their little camp and the party was there again. Everything was happy. There was no more suffering. There was no more hurt. As long as you could do this one thing, out of sight, out of mind. That's the culture we live in today. Out of sight, out of mind. Not really worrying about what others have to say. What happens when the pictures of those hungry little kids on TV come on? What do we do? We change the channel. What happens when we see, uh, when the radio station comes on, the Christian radio station comes on that we listen to, and it's marathon week? What do we do? I'm not giving money to that. We change the station. What happens when we see people in hurt every single day of our life? But you know what? We're so busy with our life, we don't have the time. What do we do? Out of sight, out of mind, we keep driving. That's the culture we live in. But folks, that's not what God asks us to do. Not as believers in Christ. Not as Christians. No, God's asked us to be a part. He's asked us to step in. And, to, and do the things that he'd want us to do. We hear, hear the reports of um, people being killed every day. I shared on Wednesday night. I won't share because of what we have, all the people we have in here. But 
I got a video that was very gruesome of how Christians are not only being beheaded, but what they do with the bodies afterwards. But we're much too busy with football season right now to think about our brothers and sisters. At least that's what the world would have us to think. Nowhere was Paul ever asked to do anything. You see, you say, well, pastor, no one's asked me to do anything. No one's asked me personally to get involved. I don't see anyone asking Paul. Let's read verse 7. Now, in the neighborhood of that place were lands lands belonging to the chief man of the island who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. Now, we see here that there's a sick man, but why was that any of Paul's concern? A matter of fact, what do we see here? There's a man who's very sick, and Paul knew that the man was very sick, and Paul had to make a decision as to what he would do. But why would Paul even get involved? No one asked him. Does it say in the text that anyone asked Paul to get involved? Does it say that the man that was treating them came to Paul and said, Paul, can you help me? Paul was a prisoner. Paul had no job. He had no money. In the eyes of the world, what was Paul but anything? He probably had chains on him. He had, he had the, the clothes of someone that was imprisoned and probably the stench to go with it. But where do you read in our text where Paul is asked, will you come? Just like many of us, we see the need. Matter of fact, we see it and we know it and we can meet it. But if we're not careful, we'll ignore it. But that's seeing James 4, 17 says this. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. I wonder how many of us live in sin. I wonder how many of us today wonder why our walk with God isn't like it should be. And and we're not doing and being able to be all that God would have us to be. Could it be that we're, we're ignoring the needs of others? You see, ministry is meeting the needs of others, not ours. It's simply saying, I see what you have and have not. And how can I help? I put it this way. If we know there's a need, sickness or whatever the sort, then we need to do our best to meet it. What did Paul do? Paul made the right decision. You see, Paul decided he would respond. That's exactly how the text says it. Let's read verse 8. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery, and Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hand on him, healed him. Just a quick note. Who told him to? Who Who told Paul to do that? Was it the guard? Or was it just the Holy Spirit? And when... This had taken place. The rest of the people on the island who had disease also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly. And when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. There again, Paul responded to the need. Paul simply saw, there's a man, he's sick, he's laying there. And I have the ability to go help him. Not that Paul was supernatural or, or anything like that. But Paul knew that he, he, was, he longed to do something. What would happen if our theme in life was simply this? When I see a need, I will meet the need. When I see a need, I will meet the need. What would happen? What would happen if you lived your life going about said, Lord, whoever you put in front of me today, that there's a need. Let me be a part of helping that need some way. But pastor, I'm... What am I to do? Look at me. And I would say, look at Paul. He's he's stranded on an island. No money, no job, in chains. Yet he made a difference so much so that many came to him and said, look, can you help us? Like you did him. People notice those that help others. People flock to helpers. You see, I believe that Paul gives us a guide to follow. I believe that Paul simply, if you read in this, I believe that Paul gives us four steps of helping the sick. 
The first step is he visited. Paul went and saw him. Paul went to the one in in need of help. Folks, let me say this. You can't help anyone if you don't actually go to them. Sometimes we have to get up off the recliner and the couch of comfort of life and go across the street and meet the need of our neighbor or loved one. It's one thing to say, Lord, I pray that you'll meet the need of those children. Lord, I pray that you'll meet the need of those young men and women. Lord, I pray that you'll meet the need. It's quite another to say, God, show me how to get to where you would have me to be. I took experiencing God. I'm so excited that we're taking, we're taking this church through experiencing God starting today. I've gone through it three times. My boys are going to go through it. It changed the very way I live my life. It changed the way I do ministry. Why? Because it's all about this. Here's the theme of experiencing God. Find where God's at work and go join him. Get up off your guff and go join where God is. Don't say, God, here's what I want to do when I want you to bless it. Experiencing God is all about teaching us. This is where God is working. I want you to go there. Folks, we must visit those in need and stop depending on everyone else to do it. You know what frustrates me sometimes is we can run some weeks over 400 people in church and yet we'll get a phone call from members telling the staff, well, y'all haven't made the visits you should have made. You mean out of 400 and something people, it's, it's, it's your staff's responsibility to do, to do it all? Are we just paid hirelings? Is that what we are? Folks, we're servants, but we're also leaders, and we're here to lead you into that, folks. Go visit your shut-ins. Go visit your family. Go visit people in Sunday school. Listen, if people in your Sunday school class aren't coming, they know you better than they know most of the staff. Go make a visit. Go see those who are relationally sick and stop making excuses. And then what did Paul do when he got there? It says he prayed. He prayed for him. I believe prayer is the greatest mediation that God's ever given us. It's the greatest weapon we have as a believer. Prayer can change eternity. It can change the entire um, way a country will go. A lot of us say, preacher, to get our country where it needs to be, we need to do this and that. Folks, I'm here to tell you, I want you to go vote and I want you to get involved, but I want you to pray. Anytime you see anything in the Bible about nations changing a direction, it had to do with prayer. Anytime you saw where people were ill and then they became better, it had to do with prayer. Even Jesus prayed for the sick. We're to pray. Simply go to them and pray. And we shouldn't say, well, I wish, I wish I could do more, but all I can do is pray. The greatest thing you can do is pray. Because God hears the prayers of his children and then comfort. We go and visit and we pray and we can give comfort. It says that Paul put his hands on him. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to a bedside and wanted to lay my hands on someone and pray, and they'd be miraculously healed. They're, I could not count. And folks, to this day, that has not happened. And if God's blessed you with that gift, then, then, then I'm, I'm grateful for you. But you know what we bring comfort? You go and you lay your hand, and you just touch them. And say, I'm here. When I would lay, when I, I was in the hospital twice, and both times my bloodstream was poisoned, so I just I had to get this. I got the extra bonus days, and both times I would wake up and I'd see my mom at the foot of the bed with her hand touching my foot. Just reminded me, mom was here, and I'd wake up many times. Usually from the pain because the morphine wore off. And Tony would be holding my hand and you say, well, is that a big deal? My wife don't hold hands. 
We'll be walking down, and I'm like, I said, let's hold hands. She's like, okay, but just for a minute. <laughs> Makes my hands so hot. Why you got to hold my hand? You know I love you. Are you ashamed of me in public? No. I just don't want to hold your hand. I'd wake up, and she's holding my hand. And she's praying. Folks, the comfort that that brought me was of great encouragement. I can't tell you how many bedsides I've been to when I'm just holding the hand of a loved one, holding the hand of a church member, a brother and sister in Christ, and just praying for them. Don't ever be so busy that you can't take a few minutes out of your day to go and, 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 and talk to someone and pray with them and just touch them. Your presence touches. It brings comfort. You see, finally we see he helped him. He helped him by healing him. It happened that the father lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and putting his hands on him, he healed him. Paul gave all he had. What did Paul have? He had the same thing you have. He had Jesus. He just simply gave the love of Jesus. He helped him with the love of Jesus. Now, Paul didn't heal the man. Christ healed the man. The Holy Spirit working through Paul's life healed that man. It wasn't Paul, but the thing is that Paul helped him by being a conduit for the Lord. God was working through Paul to help this man. Do you help others? To, to, let me ask you a question. When's the last time God worked through you to help someone? Do you even care enough to let God work through you to help someone? Listen, I, look. Football season's in, folks. It's here and I'm happy. I love it. Clemson, we whooped up on them boys. I don't even know who they were. They were low-tier team. I don't care. We won. And my boy this past week, uh, Caleb, he, he, he actually got on the field this time. And, and, and he'd run down that field. And, and, and I know the staff thinks I'm crazy because before the game, I'm like, well, he's going he's gonna to hit somebody. I'm like, boy. And I tell him, so you go out, I text him, you slobber knock them hard, son. You know what a slobber knock is? You hit them so hard, you knock the slobber slap out their mouth. <laughs> and Caleb lined up. And he's running. And he runs with his thumbs up. I don't understand that. I guess he's going, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. But he runs down that field, and there was this guy right in front of him. And I'm like, kid him. And my boy, now that boy was a lot bigger than my boy. Now my boy didn't win. But he hit him. What's that got to do with sickness? Nothing, as long as it's not a distraction. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the things that God's laid in your heart. But if it becomes a distraction where you're not helping the sick, then there's a problem. And I believe that for some of us, we've gotten distracted. For some of us, we're trying to pay that next bill. Trying to get the next house, the next car, the next whatever step the world says you have to have. Or we're, or we're focused on a relationship. Or we're focused on a relationship we don't have, but we want. And the problem with being distracted is that people will, God will put people in front of us that are in need of healing, in need of, of a touch, in need of comfort, in need of a visit, a prayer, and just some help. But we're so distracted with the things of the world that God can't use us anymore. And ministry becomes hard when we have a desire to do what God wants us to do, but yet we choose the things that God has nothing to do with. I don't think God has anything to do with football. You'll never hear me pray, please, dear Lord, let the Clemson Tigers win the national championship. I think they have to do it on their own. But I think that can be a good Christian testimony along with anybody. Are there sick people at your work? Are there sick people in your marriage? In your family? Are your neighbors sick? Are your, are your friends at school and college? Are they sick? 
Have you become so focused on your grades you can't even see the fact that people are failing in life? Hey, let me tell you something. I want everyone to make A's. I want my boys to make A's. But here's one thing I learned when I I graduated and um, I graduated with honors and all that kind of stuff. And then I took my diploma and degree and I put it up next to one of my buddies. And, but you know what? My buddy that barely got by by the skin of his teeth, his looked just like mine. Don't be so focused on making the grade of life that you forget the value of it. You see, there's people in this place today, you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's a sickness. You can ignore it or you can respond to God's love. See, that's how it works. And there's people in this room today, you have the sickness of sin in your life. You can ignore it or you can respond to God's grace. It's all in how you want to do it. So here's how the God of eternity works, the creator. It's your life. You can choose the way you want to live it. But understand, there's a consequence to every choice. Where are you at today? Maybe this morning you need to come and just pray for those that you have in your family that are sick. Maybe it's a physical, social, relational, spiritual Maybe you just need to come and pray. Maybe this morning you're sick in your heart because you don't have Jesus. Christ says, I love you. I died for you. You can ignore that or you can respond to it. It's your choice. Maybe there's things you're dealing with that I haven't even touched on, but yet the Holy Spirit spoke to you. Whatever you're dealing with today, the Lord can help. And he can change it all. But it's up to you. Let's go in prayer.